All right, chapter three, family dynamics and communicating with child and family. So this module, just a little disclaimer again, I don't own this material under fair use. I'm providing lecture content for only my nursing students using this material. All content is for educational purposes only for nursing students and does not provide medical advice. So this module is all about healthy communication, unhealthy communication, patterns of family communication, family dynamics, theories, role functioning, family structures, and age-specific approaches when communicating with patients. So um, communicating with a hospitalized child, components of the communication process, and barriers to effective communication with families. So how you define your family is um, going to be different for everyone. So when we are in the process of communicating with families, we have to really um, understand that it's bi-directional and that it needs both the sender and the receiver. And it's irreversible. So if you say something that gets under their skin, they may never come back for more care. So while you're working with families, you may see positive and negative um, communication patterns while you're while you're um, communicating with them. Sometimes if someone is underinsured or uninsured, they may forego treatment. They might use emergency rooms for their primary care provider. They might miss um, follow-up visits because of lack of transportation, employment, adequate knowledge, or other barriers, and lack the resources to get needed medications. So that's why we really need to um, have a full idea of what their boundaries are and what they can and can't do when we're providing education for them. So making sure that you're communicating well um, by identifying your role, provide them with introductions to all key stakeholders, document all phone calls um, during after office hours, oncoming, incoming outgoing calls, advice given and answers to the questions that they have asked you. Um, you. Need to ensure privacy while leaving patient messages. And then just provide anticipatory guidance um, for what they need. When you are communicating with families in an emergency, you need to make sure that it's a quiet environment so that you can communicate slowly without medical jargon. Sit down at the care provider's level um, allow plenty of um, time for them to respond and don't give false hope. Um, avoid uh, not being sincere, not being empathetic, and make sure that you know what they heard you say. So providing clear instructions and then having them provide them back would be great. Um, we know that different definitions of families are all going to be different. The family dynamics might be very different stressors that are, the child is under or the parents are under. And the reaction to the child's illness may be very different from one family member to another. So sometimes we have healthy families, sometimes we have unhealthy families in the communication. So just being careful with that. Um, sometimes there's some barriers to effective communication just, you know, alone, um, but much less having any um, speech difficulties, hearing difficulties, closed-ended questions, things like that, ignoring the family issues. Um, so making sure that you do a complete assessment. The family theories are in your book. Make sure that you understand them. Um, the definition of a family is different over time. There's family of origin, there's family of choice, nuclear family, adoptive family, blended family, cohabitating family, no parent family. So there are all kinds of definitions at this point that you just need to know. Um, the family theories um, resiliency model of family stress adaptation, 
um, Murray Bowen and his family theory. So you need to look those up and be familiar with them for the first test. Newman system theory, family focused care, structural functioning theory, King's theory, Roy's adaptation model. For the most part, Roy's is the most familiar to most people. Roy's is basically self-care theory, but we try to get the patient to do as much as we can. Um, Mary Bowen was on the human behavior theory, so he thought that there were triangles, a three-person three relationship with the smallest stable relationship, and he had a lot to do with marital conflict and dysfunction, um, impairment in the child, and emotional distance. So the small differences between siblings and parents transfer over generations and individuals choose mates with concepts similar to their own. Duval's um, has to do with eight stages based on Erickson's development. So the beginning family, the childbearing family, the preschool, school-aged, adolescent, and then launching family. Newman's system was primary prevention, alleviates risk factors, secondary prevention um, occurs after the stress, and tertiary is for maintaining factors. So again, just like the primary, secondary, tertiary, primary is prevention, secondary is screening, tertiary is treatment. So you'll see those in your book. The King's goal, uh, theory of goal attainment is basically that there's a recognition of interactions that happen in the family unit. So they set goals together and they apply interventions to achieve these goals. So nurses assist the family and the child going through that action, reaction, and interaction. Again, Sister Callista Roy um, holds that God and humans have a relationship with the environment and stay maintain to strives to maintain balance in either healthy or unhappy, healthy adaptions. So the behavior mode, psychologically, um, self-concept mode, um, psychic integrity, and then the roles of the family in society is based on self-identity. Interdependence um, is the mode that the relationships and your interactions with others, um, basic needs are nurturance and affection. Sorry. So when you meet a family, you're doing a quick family assessment. Um, which of the following de describes Duval's family? Family is a target that should be assessed and nursing interventions then applied. Um, receives the best quality care when healthcare providers work with the parents and family. The lifestyle, life cycle stages are based on structure, functioning, and roles, or emotionally connected and interdependent. So the life cycle. So he's the one that said the life cycle. So a family assessment, when you're doing a family assessment, you're seeing the size, the shape of the family, the parenting styles and the roles and the relationship in the family. Generally, we ask them to do a genogram. So we'll be doing that during school as well, during class, where you bring your family tree and you draw out your family tree. So a kinetic family drawing is one of functioning movement, structural family assessment, functional family assessment, and then the family APGAR, which is a five item and questionnaire. So let's we'll see, that's in the book as well. So the genogram is obviously in your book, and that's about um, drawing the pictorial representation of the family unit. We've all done that in kindergarten, right? We had to draw our family. Um, the kinesthetic one is um, the family and can reflect its health and its areas of distress as well. The structural family assessment, who lives in the home, what is the social, economical, cultural, religious makeup, what is the family com a composition, and what occupations do those family members have. So sometimes that also shows the triangulation with parents and families. So that's all in your book. I'm reading right down through with it. 
so you'll be able to read more on that in your book. The family APGAR um, is usually completed in an outpatient or home environment and has five things. Um, adaptation, partnership, growth, affection, and resolve. So the ability to use resources for problem solving in a crisis, the ability to share responsibility and nurturing roles in a crisis, the ability to achieve physical and emotional growth, the ability to demonstrate love and attention to family members, and the ability to devote time to other family members in the nurturing process. So it's categorized 0 to 20 as highly functioning, moderate, dysfunctional, or highly dysfunctional families. So that's a fun questionnaire. Communicating with infants and toddlers and preschoolers. So there's going to be differences, right? So knowing how to communicate with babies. It's usually babble talk, um, special toys and games, um, body language, gestures, postures, and just incorporating active communication strategy to the growth and development of that child. You're always um, assessing play in the family as well. So if they're playing, let them play a little bit so that you can see how that goes. If there's fights breaking out or are they able to coordinate and be um, a family when they're playing? Um, what else? Communicating. So infants are unable to verbalize their needs. So you're going to see nonverbal, um, smiling, promoting um, socialization. So usually babies coo when they're content and happy and crying otherwise. So separation anxiety, fear of strangers, temperament and disposition. So don't always assume that the patient is unhappy. It may just be the d dirty diaper. So making sure that you stay around long enough to see the change in the child's behavior. Um, stroking their cheek, using gentle touch. Um, learn more about their routines, a sing-song approach. So we usually talk to the baby try to cuddle with them, get them to communicate back with us. And then communicating with toddlers and preschoolers are more between the age of one and five. That's a lot more good job, um, good effort. You don't separate his actions from the origin of pain. Um, exploring objects, and they may practice or pretend on a doll before having a procedure done. So that's generally what the child life specialists do for us. Be very careful about IV. Um, the only IV that they would know about is the plant. So they might not understand when you say, I'm ready to give you an IV. It would probably be better to say stick or poke for a needle. Um, but stick could also be a stick out in the yard too. So. Just being careful with that. Um, it's interesting to hear what they call different things. Um, they're usually fearful of un unfamiliar objects, so the more that you can play with them beforehand, the better. Toddlers remember terrible to autonomy, so they say no, 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 no to everything. Um, keep unused equipment out of their room. Uh, treatment room is typically anxiety provoking, so we'll have a treatment room just to go to for the sticks and the pokes so that it's not in their bedroom in the hospital setting. So we usually um, make sure that we validate those feelings of fear and anxiety with the kids. Which of the following is an appropriate method for communicating with infants? Label the patient's emotions to validate. They don't have labels yet. Use music and sounds to, uh, that probably is it. Statements such as good boy, good girl, or good job is toddlers. Explain the limits. Oh, uh, that's not going to happen with the infant, right? So music, music and sound helps soothe a baby while you're doing your head to toe assessment. So communication with the altered families. Um, in the altered families, it's always good to know what you're walking into in that situation. So um, this may be substance abuse, coercive family processes, 
physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, chronic physical or mental abuse, hospitalization or the death of a family member. That's usually when we get involved um, and need to do an assessment. So like things like substance abuse, obviously, you would notice the substances around in the house and need to make a report on that. Coercive family processes could be like members being critical of each other, punishment is used in consistency, um, behavior is ignored, and rewards are coerced. Physical, emotional, sexual abuse, you need to read these. So secrets kept within a fa uh, family unit. Um, one member of the family is singled out for abuse and nurses are legally bound to report any suspected abuse. You need to know the difference between abuse and non-abuse when you're reading test questions because they will ask you that. If it's a plausible injury, is it plausible? Should be your thought process. Hospitalization of a family member usually triggers a crisis and death, obviously. So different um, ways of describing death. A lot of people in the U.S. just kind of shove it under the table and don't really talk about it. Kubler-Ross is one of those big names. You've got to know the Kubler-Ross stages for grief, the denial, anger, bargaining, acceptance. Those are always on test questions. So in this chapter, we covered communication in families, the definition of a family, communication theory, family theory, family assessment, communicating with children, and communicating with the altered family unit.